question. How many of you um, have attended more than three different churches in your lifetime? That's, that's a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm ringing up here, uh, Dustin, so I know you're, you're working on it. But uh, How many of you have attended more than six different churches in your lifetime? Yes, I, I realize some of that's because of moving and jobs and things like that. Uh, how many of you have attended more than two different denominations of churches? More than three? More than four? Okay. Now, in all that travel and all that time, sometimes in all these different churches, we've heard different terminology, haven't we? Sometimes we hear the same terminology, but it means something different depending on the church, the denomination that you've been part of, isn't it? And, and, and we have this Christianese that kind of goes on, right? It's, it's, it's church kind of has a language all its own. And, and it's very confusing for people who maybe are attending church for the first time. They don't know what a lot of these words mean. And it, it's, it's like its own language. It's its own culture. And people walk in and they don't know what it is. Um, Stacy and I had a chance um, a couple of weeks ago uh, to go on, and, you know, scratch something off the bucket list, saved up for over a year, and uh, got to go on a cruise to Alaska. And it was really cool, not just the temperature, but, <clears throat> <clears throat> but on that ship, there were people from all over the world. And, and, and our, um, our waiters at our table where we ate dinner were from Indonesia. And, and I, I was just being my normal self. You know, they'd say something and I'd throw a joke in there and they would just... <laughs> and and, and, and Stacy says, your, your humor is not cross-cultural. And I was like, come on, man, that's funny in any land. It wasn't, though. So, but that's what, that's what happens. You get an idea of what's going on. Sometimes you walk into a church and you don't, know, you don't know what people are talking about. They use terms that might be biblical, but we don't have any idea what they mean. I know I went to church as a young man for a long, long time. I started going to church when I was six, and I heard this one word for year after year after year after year, and I didn't know what it meant but because they used it so often in church, I thought I'm supposed to know it, but I didn't know it. And I didn't really learn its true meaning. I thought I learned its meaning when I was about 18, but I didn't. And then I learned its true meaning when I went to Bible college. And I said, well, I just, I feel let down. The, the simplest word that we hear in church all the time, repent. Repent. People don't even know what that word means. They think it means to be sorry, and that's not really what it means. It means to turn from what you're doing. There's all kinds of these words. I'm not going to give you definitions of all of them, but redemption, justification, born again. That one just sounds, <laughs> that just sounds hard, doesn't it? Evangelism, glorification, heresy, blasphemy, all these words Sometimes we throw them out there. Incarnation. Sounds like milk something, doesn't it? So, yeah. Here's my favorite one. Propitiation. That's from the King James. Threw that one out there on you. So th these words, people use them and, they, and they, they just assume that everybody knows what they're talking about because it's in the Bible, right? Everybody's read the Bible. Here at Life Coast, we really take a concerted effort to use the words from Scripture, but explain what they mean. We, that's intentional. And sometimes if, if you've been in church a long time and you know what these words mean and we're explaining it again for the 17th time and you're going, I know what it means already. Have some grace for those in the room who don't know what they mean. So there's another term that's in most churches, most church experiences, and that's the word elder. And people don't know what it means. You think of elder, and you think of Tim Conway. <laughs> Mrs. Wiggins. And, and if you know who Tim Conway is and what I'm talking about, you are elder. Because <laughs> I knew what it was. So <clears throat> We think of just somebody old. 
And, and it's an interesting term because many, many churches, many denominations have used that term, have that kind of position and place within their structure. And I just want it for us to get an understanding at Life Coast at what that is, biblical eldership, what is that, and how does that impact and affect you as the body of Christ? That's important because it's not just enough to know what it means. It's not just enough to be able to say, I can identify that word. I can give the definition to that word. It's so important for us to understand what does that mean for us as the body of Christ. And so we're going to talk a little bit about biblical eldership and what that means and how it applies to our lives, our everyday lives, and how our church functions in a healthy way. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this place. We thank you for Life Coast. We thank you for this body, Lord. Father, we love the body of Christ. You died for the body of Christ. Lord, we ask that in this time, in this, in this hour, that, that you, your spirit, would just draw us all to a place of health spiritual health, that as we grow in our faith and knowledge of God and his word, that understanding can present itself in our life as application in how we live our life, how we present to the people who do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. That is what we're called to do, to make disciples, Lord. So I ask you to be with us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I still got a little cough, and I'll, I'll try to block it when I can. But uh, the, the, first, the first term el elder is used way in Exodus in the Old Testament. Really long time ago, there were 72 elders of Israel. 72 elders of Israel. There were six elders from each tribe, each family that made up the families of Israel, the tribes of Israel. There were six for each, and that made 72 elders. And that's an interesting number, because if you follow it into the New Testament, when Jesus was sending out those to bring the gospel when he was on earth, he sent out how many? 72, same number. And so we, we, gotta, we take a hold of that, and we find some in interest in that. Why, do, why does that happen? Why is that such a significant number? Thousands of years later... So we're talking about Exodus is where the elders were appointed, the six elders from each. Thousands of years later, there are still these 72 elders that are there when Jesus comes on the scene and walks on the earth. When the incarnation happens, I'll throw that in there, when Jesus becomes a man. And there's still these 72 elders, but they've become something different. Thousands of years ago, they were just the representatives that would come and meet with Moses, and they would help their family, their, the family that of Israel, to understand what God's will was, what God's will was for Israel as a whole and as a family distinctively. That's important because now these 72 elders have become what we know in Jesus' time as the Sanhedrin. Okay, they've become this ruling class, this law keepers, what we would think of as the Supreme Court in our day in America. That's the equivalent of what those 72 elders became. That was never their intent from the beginning, but that's what they developed into is this legal board that was causing, um, forcing people and making people obey the law with harsh and cruel punishment when they did not. So they became this. And so then, as Jesus came on, on the earth, died on the cross for our sins, the era of grace came in, the church era came in, and this term continued into the church age and into the, the New Testament church. And we see it in Acts chapter 14, verse 23. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Someone, someone will give you a Bible if you want one. You can keep that Bible. We're going to start right here at Acts Acts 14, verse 23. <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church 
and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. And so what happened? These elders became spiritual elders, not just older, mature representatives of the families. They became spiritually mature representatives of the local family of God. Okay, does that make sense? They're still representatives of the family, but a spiritual family, not a physical, biological family. And so they're still the same function, but they're there to represent grace and truth, not the law. Okay, so there's a whole different thing that takes on. And there's these, this Greek word called presbyteros, presbyteros. I don't expect you to understand that, but it's interesting in that there's these words in Scripture in English. Sometimes they're translated as elder. Sometimes they're translated as pastor. Sometimes they're translated as deacon. Sometimes they're translated as overseer or bishop you might have in your Bible. And so a lot of these words are the same. So I'm going to kind of just help us and give us the, 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 the English word, the Greek word, and then a further definition, and, and we'll walk from that point on. So deacon... The Greek word is diakonos, and it really means servant or worker. But the literal translation, diakonos, diakonos, through the dirt or through the dust. So so, so a deacon is someone who goes through the dust. We might think of it this way. We have a, a very similar saying in our culture that says they're in the trenches. They're in the trenches. So for our equivalent here at Life Coast Church and many churches, the, the, the deacon is someone who is represented as a ministry leader, someone who's involved, engaged in ministry, okay? So now we have elder, and that's presbyteros, as I said, and it, and it actually means older, mature, sometimes wise, depends on the person, but... Uh, but that's, that's the term that's used. And when presbyteros is used, it's usually referring to someone in the New Testament who's mature in their faith walk. Okay? So now we have overseer, episkopos. And when I'm talking about Joe, I'm, I, come on, I got a few Saturday Night Live fans. Episcopos is the word, and that's, and that's a guardian, or a, almost like a superintendent, administrator, someone, someone who is, who's looking over something, okay? And then we have pasture. Poimeno is the word, and that means literally shepherd, someone who cares for the flock. So these four words are used, <clears throat> and for our purposes, I'm actually going to take deacon and move it out, because these are not part of the, 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 the deacon process. The deacon um, position is really someone who is really engaged in doing, doing, doing the ministry. They're active. They're, they're over direct ministry, singular ministry, like Stephen and those first appointed, Philip and those first appointed deacons were doing the ministry. They were waiting on tables. They were, they were actually involved and engaged. And so that one is not really fitting the definition of elders that we're going to be talking about today. But I know that some people out of your church experience or background look at deacons as elders. I was actually in the, in the church many, many years ago, a deacon, but we functioned as elders in that church. And we ended up actually changing what that entire team was and called them elders because, because of the Bible. So, and so that's, in at Life Coast Church, we look at that that way. Our ministry leaders, those who are over kids' church, those who are over uh, greeting services, those are, we look at them under the definition that is deacon. We may not call them that specifically, but when we're looking for people who are rising up to be leaders, we take that definition that the Bible uses for a deacon. These are the people that we're looking at. So just so you're aware of that. So Acts 20 helps us to get a better understanding of the other three terms. Acts 20, verses 17 and 28. The context is the same, and it's spread out. So I, I, I didn't want to read you know, 11 verses for you when I only really needed two. But the context is the same for both verses. So from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church... 
And he said a whole bunch of things, and then he said this. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. <clears throat> what he's saying here is that these positions, these three positions, have a real equality when it comes to the leadership of a church. Overseer, pastor, and elder. There's, a, there's a, an equality that's going on there. That, that these people, you will look at them the same. When you're selecting a pastor, when you're selecting an overseer, when you're selecting an elder, these things we're going to look at are the same and they apply to all of these positions. Okay? So we, we, uh, these, these are the things we're going to look at. These, these are directly related to, to these positions. So I'm going to go to two portions of Scripture that outline what we're looking for for pastors, elders, and overseers. And that's 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and then I'll read uh, Titus 1, 5 through 9. So here is a trustworthy saying. This is 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone was, does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. And then, similarly, uh, Titus 1, 5 through 9 speaks about elders, but you'll see almost exactly the same List There's some uh, very few differences. First Timothy 1, 5 through 9. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charges of being wild and disobedient. <coughs> Excuse me. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless... Not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. And he must hold firm to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Okay, so there's a lot of information there, and, and I'm just going to quickly break some of this down for you, because in just little, short, little bites and categories, so, so you can, and you can see if you have notes that you have sections to do that, and um, to write these in if you so desire. But uh, we're going to look at these categories, but I want you to understand that these are not qualifications, they are more of character qualities, Okay, they're not something that people are. Um, I'm trying to check this list off so I can be an elder or a pastor or a deacon. I'm not checking this list off. This is what people have become that we recognize in them, as the Holy Spirit has changed and moved in their life. Okay, they become more and more godly. So the first category is as to God and His Word. What did those lists say about God and His Word? That one, He cannot be a recent convert. They shouldn't be a recent convert. Shouldn't be someone who's just a new believer. And in some churches I've been experienced with, that someone was very attractional, they got radically saved, they were a new believer, they were drawing people because of their personality or their makeup, and someone put them in a position of authority, and it did exactly what the Bible said, became conceited and overbearing because they started to think that they were really all that. And it was really uh, too early for them to be an elder or a deacon or whatever the position was. So number two, they must be disciplined. That's from Titus. They must be disciplined. And that means that they're just not a crazy person. They're not flying here and there. They're, they're disciplined. They, they, they walk 
in a disciplined lifestyle. They do things the way they're supposed to be done. They hold firm. Number three, they hold firm to a trustworthy message. They can teach and refute. Those are important. Now, we're not expecting every single person, every single elder, every single overseer um, to be a Rhodes Scholar, a biblical theologian, but they understand what essential beliefs are, and they can recognize someone who does not hold to those essential beliefs. That's an important aspect of it, okay? Now, sometimes we approach people and say, we've been, we've been watching you like you to pray about being an elder, and they say, oh, I don't think I know enough. And we've been watching. You, you know plenty. And so uh, we understand that they're into the Word of God. They're, 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 they're learning, they're growing, they're consistent, they're disciplined in their approach to God and His Word. They're, they're pursuing that. And so we, that, that's what we're looking for in these people. The next list is as to themselves. What, what do they see in themselves? What do we see in them? And the first list is they aspire to the office of overseer. Now, there's an important distinction here because there's, 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 there's two kinds of desires that are talked about in Scripture. One is a selfish desire that, that desires to have authority, position, power, prestige, to be in the limelight. That's not the desire that this is talking about. This is a humble desire. This is a desire that says, I I I desire this position for the kingdom of God. I desire this position because I love walking with people, because I love to be an example. I enjoy teaching and and walking with people. This This is a whole different kind of desire than the desire to be in authority, okay? They must be temperate. What does that mean? Uh... A sober in spirit, controlled and disciplined, a very similar aspect to the, to the discipline. Thing. That's from 1 Timothy. That temperate means that, that they have a, um, a governor on their emotions and their moods and what, what, they, what they pursue. And they, they seek God in those things. Number three, they're prudent. That's also from 1 Timothy. They're, 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 they're <laughs> the, the, the actual Greek word is, is almost, a, almost a negative connotation. It says, they're not insane. <laughs> they're not crazy, okay? They're, 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 they're prudent. They have sound judgment. They are reasonable. That's the, that's the word. So uh, they're not quick-tempered. They don't have a short fuse. Their emotions don't lead them. Okay, not that they don't have emotions. They're not led by their emotions. They, they, they're, they're not, they're, they're not, um, they're, the word actually is they're not, a, they're not a striker. They don't hit people, okay? So, um, number three is as to their family, as to their family. It says to the husband of one wife. And what that really translates is they're a one woman man. A one-woman man. That's what it really means. And, and so, you know, sometimes I, I know in my, my history with churches is that as they were selecting elders and, and they say, well, they couldn't have anyone who was ever divorced and remarried because you have, to, you have to be a husband of one wife. But that's not what that says. Because some guys uh, or some ladies uh, get married and get divorced and they never knew Jesus at any time during that, during that time period. They, 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 they come and have an experience with Jesus Christ. They're radically saved. Their heart has changed. They're a different person. And grace abounds. And, and they have become a one-woman man. So that's the difference there. Number two, they manage their own household well. So there's not chaos going on in their house. It's like, you know, someone who comes to church and you're like, bless you. And bless you, God. Oh, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. And you go to the house and they're like, what are you doing over there? What are you doing? Get out of there. The place is chaos. It should be the same. There should be a balance between what's going on in their home and what's going on in their life. I wanted to see if everyone was awake. The last section is as to others. As to others. And this is a little bit longer list because, quite frankly, as we grow in our faith, in our walk with Christ, our perspective about ourselves should be 
about how does it impact and affect others. And that's why this list is so much longer. Because that should be our heart. As any believer, not just an elder, pastor, or overseer, anybody following after Christ should begin in their heart to think about others before themselves. And this is, this is the list that it gives. They should be hospitable. And sometimes I like to say hospital, but that's a different thing altogether. They're able to teach. And what does that mean? Does that mean that they have to stand up here and give a message to the entire church? It could mean that, but it's not restricted to that. Able to teach who? Maybe they're teaching in kids' church. Maybe they're teaching one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Maybe they lead a small group. Maybe they're teaching just their, their close circle of friends. But are they able to teach? And they're talking about the Word of God. Can they bring people to the Word of God and help them to understand it? That's what able to teach means. Not overbearing. And the opposite of that is a term that we use at Life Coast all the time, and that's called life-giving. Are they life-giving? Because someone who's overbearing is repelling people. Someone who's life-giving draws people into their circle. Are we life-giving or are we overbearing and people don't want to be around us? Love, loving what is good. Loving what is good. That, that is just a chasing after God. Chasing after who he is. It's a lover of goodness. He's a man, he's a person who's devoted to what is good. Not violent, and that's where the striker again comes in. He's not a striker. His first impulse is not to punch you out. And let me tell you, early in my life, I was that guy. I know you look at me and you say that that wouldn't happen, but I'm sorry it happened. And sometimes I was the guy who got punched out. So <laughs> you learn, you live, you learn. You duck. Should have slipped that one. Not quarrelsome. It, are, you, are you somebody who wants to get into an argument? Do you pick quarrels? Or are you somebody who stays away from them? Even if you disagree with someone, do you do it without being disagreeable? You know what? There's a difference. We can have a disagreement and not have a quarrel. And are we that, are we that kind of person? Gentle. And the word refers to that under control, that power under control. It's like driving a Ferrari at the speed limit. You know, that's, that's what that word is saying. You have power and authority, but you use it in a controlled, sensible way. Just and upright. And this is in relationships with God and relationship with others. In your decision making, are you wise? Are you truly fair? Are you objective? Can you be objective? Can you remove yourself from the emotions of a situation and approach it objectively? That's what that means, upright and just. Respectable, orderly, balanced. This is what the Word of God talks about. There is so many principles in the Word of God that just talk about balance, having a balanced life. Not too much in this area, not too much in that area, but you're walking with balance. And here's a really important one, number 10, last one. Having a good reputation with those on the outside. It's not enough to be known within the body of Christ as being a good, godly person. Are you known for being a good person and a godly person outside of the walls of the church, outside of the relationships of the church. You have to have both of those. That's what we should all be pursuing. So what does it mean for us in the church? Understanding the functions of pastors and overseers and elders of our church. See, we, the, the ministries of Life Coast are just going to flow better. They're just going to be healthier if the majority of the people who call themselves Life Coast Church understand how the body functions together. It's just like your own physical body. It's just like, just like my body. I, I've come to understand that when I get over a certain weight, I have digestive issues. Some of you Italians might call it agita. You get that, that, that indigestion. And my cap is 210 pounds. 
When I get over 210 pounds, I have issues. And so I keep a governor on that, except when I go on a cruise. <clears throat> and, and you try to keep yourself on. I understand how my body works best, and I put things in place to help it function. I put processes in place to help it function best. This is the same way with the body of Christ. God has given us processes, systems, and, and um, positions for the body to function at its healthiest. Okay? There is an, there is an order among equals that when God appoints people within the body of Christ... There's an order among equals that helps the body function best. And for those who are part of the body, who do I look to as I'm growing and learning? Who do I go to when I have struggles? Who do I talk to when I'm having a hard time? Who do I celebrate with when I, great things are happening in my life? This isn't all about the bad stuff. This is all about the good stuff too. Who do I come to? This is the overseers and the pastors and the elders. They all have distinct callings. All elders, pastors, and overseers, they're all overseers of the church and of doctrine. They're all pastors of the people and the gospel. And they're all elders of life and faith. They're all for all of that. But each one We've built a distinction. The Bible has built a distinction into, into this. So, so we can structure our individual fellowship in, in a way that helps it work best. We talk about our vision, our mission, and our values. We can structure the Life Coast body according to our values, according to our mission that God, our vision that God's called us to. And so there is some leeway in what, what positions these things are. Pastors, it talks about in Scripture, as, as being um, someone for, for double honor. That these are people who are, are, get a paid position, that they do this full time, that they oversee the church. Then there's overseers that are kind of administrative, superintendent. They're looking from the outside in or from over on top to make sure that everything is functioning properly. And they ask questions. And for us, the elders are those people who are within the body, that are mature believers, who have the qualities of a pastor. And they are walking with you. They're part of the accountability for both the body of Christ and the pastors, as well as the overseers that are outside. They're an important part of this because they are pastoring the people of this church. Just like I'm pastoring the people of this church. Our elders are amazing, let me tell you. Let me tell you, we got some amazing elders here. We really, truly do. I, wa I, want, you to, I want you to know who they are, but I also want a, a distinction to tell you. That in some churches, this is not how things go. But I'm going to give you a verse, Ephesians 5, 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. You notice that all the gender applications in all of the elder qualifications were all male. Okay, At Life Coast, we look at the principles of Scripture, the balance of Scripture. And we see two principles at work here. Is that there's an order among equals within a household, husbands and wives. But there's also a oneness to that. And we hold true to that. I hold true to that in my own family, in my own home. I, I weigh what Stacy, Stacy's opinion is, what her, what her discernment is on things, because we are one. God's put us together for a purpose. I don't discount anything that this amazing woman of God shares with me. I add it to, what, to the direction I go, because she adds to me and I add to her. And it's the same with our elders. Even though the distinctions are male, when, I, when we call an elder, when we talk to an elder, we don't talk to just the man. We talk to the couple. Because one without the other is not complete. And so our elders are both 
the husband and the wife. When you look at them, look at them together, unified. When you speak with either of them, understand you're speaking with both. The same thing with our families. I want us to understand that. God's intention for, mar- for marriage was for husband and wife to be one. And so we take those principles seriously. We don't discount them. So these people, these elders and their wives, they pray for us. They hold us accountable. They, they walk with us. They encourage us. They protect us. Both the body and the, the pastors and the staff. And I want to introduce our elders to you, and we are going to officially pray over a new couple that are elders in the church. And so as they make their way up, I'm going to talk about uh, one of our couples, our elders that can't be here. We'll put the picture up. RT and Vicky couldn't be here this week, and so they're away, but they're a, an amazing couple that are, are part of our elder team. And uh, they've, they've walked with us. They've walked with the body and um, if we also, if we have any pastors and their wives that can uh, come up here as well uh, that, are, that are here today or in the vicinity. I know a lot of them are doing things, so they're not here today. They're, well, they're not in the, in the auditorium. <clears throat> so uh, my next couple is uh, Jenny and James Allen. So don't you love these guys? I've been walking with this couple for, for a number of years now. There is nothing I wouldn't share with them, and, and there, there's, there's nothing I wouldn't go to them for wisdom and counsel. And uh, Dave and Michelle Blackwell, here they are. <coughs> These guys I've gotten to know over the years, and, and when I first met Dave, I thought he looked like Kevin Costner, and so that's, you know, that's what drew me to him. So <laughs> but I've just grown to love this couple, the wisdom the godliness, the pursuit of God's word. They, they've just infused into my life uh, such grace and, and such humility, and I, and I love them dearly. We refer to Dave as our elder elder. So he loves that. <laughs> and uh, my wife Stacy's come on out, and I don't know who else is back there. But um, And this morning, uh, we're going to pray over, lay hands on, because we spoke about that at the beginning, uh, our newest elder and his wife, Daryl Natasha Glover. <laughs> now, now I, I want you to understand that when we walk through all of these things, these were not qualifications. They were qualities of the character of these people, of all of these people. And so... You know, if, if your desire is to be an elder, if your desire is to walk with God, these are the qualities that you should strive towards. And 1 first, uh, first Corinthians 11.1 1 says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Okay? When you have elders in your body that are elders like these people represented up here, you want to follow a life, you want to look at someone, the character that you can emulate, you can follow, you can walk with, you look to these people. Because we saw this in them for a long time. They're not new believers. They've been believers. They've walked with God. They follow his word. And I'm going to tell you something. They're not perfect. Okay? But they follow with all of their heart, the one who is perfect. That's the difference. We're all going to mess up. I just messed up this week. I did. Really, really a good one. <laughs> but what do you do? You go and you make it right. You, you, you go and pursue reconciliation. That's what makes things right. We don't always get it right. But with God's word and the help of the Holy Spirit, we can pursue making it right. Can I get a good amen on that? Now you can write that down. That'll preach all day long. So this morning, I'm going to get Daryl and Natasha into the middle here. And uh, for us to get around them, I'm going to have our elder elder, Dave, uh, pray over them. And uh, then I'll pray as well. Go ahead, Dave. Heavenly Father, what a great day this is. And Lord, as we just heard everything laid out by Pastor Jeff, Lord God, about eldership and about the requirements and about the things that are seen as an elder. 
I couldn't help think of, and those that know Daryl and Natasha couldn't help but think of, wow, those things Daryl and Natasha have already met. So, Father, again, as we just lift him up to you now, we just pray, Lord God, you're covering over him. We pray, Lord God, for his discernment and your wisdom, Father, to be just flowed through him. Again, Father, it's about you. Our directives, Lord God, are about you. It's not about our opinions. It's about you. Mm. So, Father, again, just (coughs) fill him up. Bless him. Bless Natasha. Bless those, Lord God, that are around him. The servant we know he already is, Lord God, the love he has for you, let it flow out to those that are in this congregation, to those that are in this community. So, Father, again, we are truly blessed, Lord God, to have him part of the eldership of this church. So, Father, again, we just praise you. We thank you for the work you did long ago, knowing that this day, right today, would be here. So, Father, we just lift him up to you now. We praise him, and, Lord God, above all else, we praise you and hold you above all. It's in the precious name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Father God, we, as your word calls us to lay our hands and pray for blessing, anointing, for great direction and discernment, Lord, we, we, we call on the Spirit to just cover this family with a blessing. Their, their family unit now of Daryl and Natasha, but we know that their heart's desire is to adopt those two girls from Haiti. We ask you to begin to bless them even now, e- even where they are, that they're part of this family, and that as a body of Christ, that we can continue to hold up each one, Daryl and Natasha, R.T. and Vicky, James and Jenny, Dave and Michelle. Can we hold them up in prayer? Hold them in esteem. Honor them. That's what you call us to do, Lord. Look to them. You, you have grown each of these couples to be the leaders that they are. And we want to honor you and, and bless them. Anoint them with our love, but mostly your blessing. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, all of you to, to head back and be in the lobby so people can, can speak with you and, and uh, bless you and give you a hug. And, and one last thing I'd like to, to say to all of us as a body of Christ is that as we talked about the qualities of the character of these people, That's their story. And I'm going to ask you, what's your story? Does your story capture those qualities as well? What's your story? How do you sing? This is my story. This is my song. Do I praise my Savior all the day long? Who are you walking with? Who are you looking to? Who are your mentors? Who are your disciples? The Bible calls us to make disciples. It doesn't say make converts. It says make disciples. To walk with somebody. Come up alongside one of these folks. They're amazing in all the, in their life and what they do. And as I said, they're not perfect. But they're chasing after God with all their heart. Our body will be healthier when we know what our story is and how our story shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Let's be a healthy body for this community to see because when people see healthy, vibrant, excited people for Jesus Christ, when they see excitement about showing up and gathering together, they want to join the crowd. They might not even know why. They just know there's something going on there and I want to be part of it. That's your story. I hope that's your story today. That you're excited about what Jesus is doing here at Life Coast Church and that you're sharing that. That's what I see in each one of these couples. And I hope we can all join together and pursue that call in our own lives. Let's all stand. Father God, I praise you and thank you 
for this, for this time we've had together. Pray again for Daryl and Natasha as they enter into this season of their life that you would just bless them. Bless us all as a body so that we understand how to function in a healthy way, that we have go-to people in our life, that when we need a question answered, when we're going through a struggle, when we want to share our joys and sorrows, we know where we can go. It's not all about, it's not about the pastor. It's not about the overseers. It's not just about the elders. It's about the body of Christ and that God has created an order among equals. We're all your children. Bless us, Lord. Let's worship now. What's your story?